and we are live. Well, welcome everybody and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ and it is an honor, a privilege and a pleasure to introduce my next guest who actually needs no introduction. He is Dr. Neil Barnard. He is both the founder and the president of PCRM. He's authored probably over 20 books now. I have most of them on my lap, but many of you might know him from The, the Cheese Trap. And then of course, a few of my personal favorites is Breaking the Food Seduction, and the one that I probably recommend to most people, Dr. Barnard's program for reversing diabetes. I've always, oops, have always said that if vegan ever became a country, the president should be Dr. Neil Barnard. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here and answer some of the questions. Well, thank you, AJ. It's great to be talking with you today. And in case you didn't know, Dr. Neil Barnard is also the keynote speaker at our live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Vegas, Labor Day weekend. He's going to be giving two lectures. And if you can't attend in Vegas, maybe get the live stream. So let's just jump right in because what I like about, well, I like everything about you, but one of the things I really like about you as, as both a doctor and a plant-based doctor is you seem to really believe in food addiction. There's a lot of doctors that don't. They just think that, that we're flawed or troubled. But you gave an epic talk that everybody can see on YouTube called How to Magnify magnetize a baby. So you do believe that certain foods are addictive. Am I correct? Yeah. I, I Well, not, yes. In fact, I would go further. And not only are there certain foods that are addictive and by addictive, I mean, they have physiological effects on the body that cause you to get habituated to them and to want them. But, but AJ, I'm going to go a step further. I think that this is just about universal because 20 years ago, or maybe even today for, for some people, the idea is that a food addict is just that one in a hundred person who's up till three in the morning stuffing their face with potato chips while they're while they're watching TV. Um, but I believe that food addictions in a more subtle way are pretty much universal, which is to say that that there are physiological properties of foods that will hook absolutely anybody. So in the Breaking the Food Seduction, you mentioned that chocolate, cheese, meat, and sugar are probably four of the most addictive foods. Right. Most of the people that will be attending the conference in Vegas are already vegan, so they're not eating meat and cheese. But sugar and chocolate doesn't seem to be the only food that they have problems with. They often have problems with flour-based products like breads, pasta, and even some of the higher fat foods like the nuts and the seeds. Have you found that to be true in, in so many cases? Um, they, they, they may, um, or they may think they have a, a problem. Um, but let me go back for just a second because the the wackiest one I thought was cheese. <laughs> and, and and the reason I say that is even if I'm talking to vegans, I want them to know the story about cheese for two for, for two reasons. Partly they had this this issue themselves. And the other reason is that everyone around them has the same issue. And it's good for them to understand it. And the way this started was we were doing research studies here on diabetes, and people would go vegan and they would do great. They would lose weight and their diabetes would come under so much better control and everything. However, I would hear so many people say, I love it. I feel so great, but I really miss cheese. Mm. It wasn't that they missed chicken salad. They didn't miss a steak. It wasn't a burger. It was specifically cheese. And I kept hearing it over and over again. I thought, what is that about? And so I started looking into it. And that's when we found several things. Number one, that there are actual chemical opiates in the cheese that are part of the casein protein in milk and they're concentrated in cheese. And when you digest it, these opiates do go to the brain and they attach to the very same brain receptors that morphine attaches to, only it comes from cheese. Um, they're not as strong about, um, the strongest has about one-tenth the brain binding power compared to pure morphine, but it's strong enough to get you hooked. And this has health effects and it's fattening. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the whole idea that you could be hooked on Velveeta, <laughs> such an outrageous idea. But, but when you talk to people, they will all nod their head and they say, that was my hardest thing yeah. to give up. So anyway, I, I don't want to just brush, brush past it. Sure. But I want to make sure that, that when, when your vegan friends are sitting down with their cheese eating, meat eating, parents, colleagues, workmates, whoever, and those people say, well, I could be vegan except for cheese. Um, we started to understand what this is about. Um, and from there, you know, that we can, and the reason I wrote the cheese trap is I wanted to see, I want people to see that this is not just a benign little detail in the diet. It's a huge source of calories, of fat, of cholesterol. There's more, more salt in cheese than there is in potato chips. And 
there are hormones in it that are not in other foods. I'm talking about estrogens. They come from the gut. So, so anyway, that's a big, 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 big thing. And I am convinced that if we could, if, if we could do nothing other than get the cheese out of our lives, that the population would, would, would really improve so much. And I agree with you when I'm talking to quote regular people, I don't know if they're regular, but you know, people that aren't vegan, like when no, I no, teach if they're eating a lot of cheese, they are not regular. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when I'm I'm talking to the people who are at the wall, uh, the, the Walgreens getting the fiber supplements because they are so mm -hmm. constipated because, because you don't just have in your brain, um, you don't just have the narcotic uh, receptors in the brain. You also have them in your gut. And so in the same way that a person who has a narcotic after surgery as a painkiller, they get constipated from that. If a person eats a lot of cheese, the narcotics in that will, will cause constipation for exactly the same reason. So, so I can, I can see your viewers all nodding their heads saying, I know exactly what you mean. Yep. I used to eat cheese. That happened to me. And that's mm -hmm. what it's about. Well, actually no animal products have fiber, none, you know, well, so. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, none of them have fiber, but I'm going a step further. Right. Um, cheese not only has zero fiber, so it tends to block people up, but, but, the protein in the cheese called casein breaks apart, releases narcotic compounds called casomorphins that paralyze the gut. I, wow. and, and that, I shouldn't say paralyze, but they'll slow it down. They cause the constipation. Um, were you there that day? We had a, um, in Los Angeles about a year and a half ago, I was with Mary Lou Henner. And Mary Lou was talking to our group of physicians committee supporters all about her 17 days without a bowel movement. It was. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it sounds a little kind of gross right now, but Mary Lou, Mary Lou wrote the the whole um, uh, preface for the book um, because she just was the biggest cheeseaholic in the world, and as you know now, Mary Lou has completely cleaned up her diet, thrown all that stuff out, and she is the most healthy person I know, um, and the greatest advocate in the world. But anyway, she shared um, she, she shared her um, her. Uh, dark past as a cheese addict. And anyway, constipation is part of it. So anyway, but that's not what you asked me about, AJ, is it? Oh, I, I was just saying, I was just saying that, no, I just want people to know, and they probably do, that no animal products have fiber and cheese is right. especially worse. But, but so it's, I don't want people to think, well, okay, I'll give up the cheese and I'll eat beef and chicken. No, you don't do that. We want you to give up all the animal products, but cheese, dairy is a great place to start. And when I speak to the regular people, that's usually what I tell them to do first and foremost is to give up yeah. the dairy which is often the hardest. Like you said, our good friend Howard Lyman said that it was harder for him to stop cheese than it was to quit smoking. It's yes, but and, and people think, well, that's just a detail. You know, if I find vegetarian, but eating cheese isn't that like almost as good as being vegan. And it is super surprising because the cheese, it, as I mentioned, the fat content of cheese is worse than a steak. I, and just the bad fat, the saturated fat, worse than worse than a steak, worse than chicken, worse than, worse than all of them. The cholesterol content is about the same as meat. Um, the sodium content, much, much higher. Um, if it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. So anyway, <laughs> we're gonna try to get rid of this stuff. Well, I can imagine that as bad as cheese is, ice cream probably isn't much better because then you've got the other addictive compounds like the sugar in there too. Uh, you got it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, absolutely. So where did you find all this out about this casomorphine research? Because most people, unless they've read your book or have heard you speak, most people don't know it. And even when they hear it, they don't want to believe it. It's a completely new idea for many people, but I'll tell you who it's not new for. Um, dairy farmers. Um, they've yeah. known for a long, long period of time all about um, the addictive qualities of cheese, the casomorphins in cheese, and they also know about the hormones. You know, your average person eating a slice of cheese doesn't know what the dairy farmer knows. The dairy farmer knows that to get that, to get milk out of a cow, the cow has to give birth. To give birth, the cow has to be impregnated. So the cows artificially inseminate, the, the farmers artificially inseminate the cows. They're pregnant for about nine months, similar to human duration. And all of that nine months, they're making hormones, they're making estrogens, it gets into the milk, the milk is turned into cheese and the estrogens are concentrated in the cheese. Now it's only, it's only traces. It's not a lot, it's only traces. However, researchers in Rochester, New York, found that men who eat the most cheese have the, the lowest sperm counts. I'm talking about mm. a study in a fertility clinic. Um, a, a more worrisome study in California looked at women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer, and they looked at whether they lived or died as the years went by. And the more the women ate high-fat dairy products, I'm talking about butter and cheese, 
the, those women who had the most high fat dairy, the most cheese and whatnot, they had a 49% higher mortality compared to the other women. And, and so what, what I'm getting at here is this question. A, a pregnant cow makes estrogens and granted it's only a trace that you're feeding to your seven-year-old daughter when you give her a grilled cheese or to your 43-year-old wife or husband or whoever it is. But could those traces of female sex hormones that you're dosing yourself with in every bite of cheese, is that enough to affect human biology? And I, I would have said no. It's, it's just a tiny bit. But the research has forced a lot of us to rethink that and to say, if you're dripping hormones into the body that already has, you, you've already got all the hormones na Mother Nature had in mind for you, and you're adding a little bit extra. This tips some people over into cancer, and it tips some cancer patients over into recurrence and mortality. Yeah, people are loving what you're saying. Some are saying they didn't realize this. Uh, Sarah's saying that one of the slogans is, ah, the power of cheese. So they apparently did know how, how addictive it, it is from the very beginning. You know. When I was growing up, uh, you know, I, I often heard that women are supposed to have menarche, the start of their menses, you know, like 17, 18, 19, like in other countries. And even like in the 70s, the girls in my high school were getting it like at 10 and 11, 12, which was considered way early. And now I'm reading about little girls getting it as young as six. Do you think the fact that they're putting so many hormones into the cows is affecting when women are, are, are reaching menarche? I think it's a couple of things. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's part, yes, it is partly because of the hormones that, that you're actually ingesting with cheese. And back, you know, we didn't use, we didn't used to eat cheese the way people do now. If you went, if you went way back in time, the USDA started tracking in 1909, how much of, do, do people eat of various agricultural products? And for cheese, uh, back in 1909, the average American ate 3.8 pounds per year. In 1909, 3.8 pounds. We, we couldn't get through four pounds of cheese per person in a year's time. Well, 2018, it's about 35 pounds. Um, and every single pound of it has got these hormones in it. So that's number one. The, the other part of it, though, is as you were saying earlier, animal products have no fiber. So fiber is not just some bland concept of roughage in the diet. When your liver is removing estrogen, and you know, your liver does, you, your, your liver filters your blood and it looks for things that don't belong there. And if, if there's too much estrogen or too much testosterone or, or medications um, or, or, or uh, toxic compounds you might have inhaled, your liver removes them. It sends them through a little tube called the bile duct into your intestine. And so there, these excess estrogens are, it, it, they adhere to fiber in the intestinal tract and out they go. What if your lunch was yogurt and chicken breast. There's no fiber in that because those are animal products. The liver still filters the blood. It still pulls the estrogens out. But what happens is it then, the estrogens end up in the intestinal tract with no fiber to carry them out. So they are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. As soon as you restore that fiber, the estrogen levels calm down and everything that relates to them gets better. Menstrual cramps get better. Um, we've seen changes with endometriosis, changes with fertility, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I'm actually working on a new book now called Hormone Haywire. Um, wow. It's about how foods are, are causing our hormones to go totally out of whack. But anyway, I'm going to point a finger of blame at cheese as being a, a big part of this, but animal products in general are part of it. And since the 1800s or so, our animal product consumption has gradually been going up. Our grandparents knew about beans. Mm -hmm. When was the last time? You know, some kids in high school had beans, you know, as a main dish. You know, these are the forgotten foods of the past. Um, whole grain beds and vegetables and fruits, they, these were poor people's foods. Yeah. Um, and nowadays, it's uh, burgers and chicken nuggets and pepperoni pizza and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So Sarah's saying, but well, what about goat's milk? Is that okay? Because, or is it still is casomorphine is casomorphine regardless of the animal it comes from? Uh, casomorphine is casomorphine regardless right. of the animal it came from. And I, I let me... Let me break your heart about goat's milk. Um, first of all, the reason that people pick goat's milk in, in recent years isn't because they thought it was healthier. They thought it sounded more picturesque. You're going to some little farm somewhere and they've got some goats and you can get to know the farmer um, and it's slightly higher in saturated fat. So it's a little creamier. If anything, it's worse. And, and by the way, can, can I just say one thing to all the people who have a heart for animals? Um, 
that female goat did not want to get impregnated, but she got impregnated because the farmer says, look, I need milk out of you. And for milk, you got to have a, a kid. She will give birth to that kid. And that kid is not going to suckle, at least not for very long, because the goat farmer wants to sell the, the milk. So that if that's a, a male goat, he's going to be killed. He's going to be he's going to be goat meat very soon. And if it's a female, she's not going to suckle either. She's going to eventually join the dairy herd. If it's a cow, all the males are killed as veal. Uh, the females are separated from their from their mothers um, at birth, and they are they live in a hutch. And if you live near a dairy farm, dairy farm, you will hear them calling out at night for their their calves that they miss. And the calves are freaked out because you're impregnating the animals. And you're taking away their their offspring. It's we all think, well, you know, I want yogurt, I want milk, I'll just make the animals go through this. So every dairy cow is artificially inseminated with not the most nice procedure. Then they are separated from their offspring. They go through this a few times. When they're four years old, they're all killed. Um, and they're replaced with their offspring because they produce more milk per unit feed. So the dairy industry is a meat industry, but you just have to go through this artificial insemination period three or four times, and then they kill you. That's why it, I find it so interesting when people say they're vegetarian, not vegan for ethical reasons, that the dairy and the egg industry are probably the two cruelest industries of all the animal production. Well, you know, people are well-meaning, you know, and they have a heart for animals. And so they say, well, I won't eat meat. I won't eat chicken. I won't eat fish. But dairy is okay because you don't hurt anybody. And, and they mean well. But it's just when you go to the farm um, and you, you say, I'm going to go with you and see what you do in the course of a day. And look. One other fact for any vegetarian who is kind of on the, the borderline, here's how you artificially inseminate the cow. And this, every glass of milk you ever had came from this source. You take your left arm and you put a glove on it all the way up to your shoulder. And your left hand goes into the rectum of the cow. This is, you're gonna inf artificially inseminate her today. You're, you insert your left hand into her rectum and through the rectal wall, you can feel the uterus. Then with your right hand, you take uh, what looks like a knitting needle and you shove it through her cervix and you inject semen that you took from a bull. And none of these animals are volunteers, but they are not going to object because she is chained up by the neck and she can't turn around. She can't do anything. She's going to get pregnant. And then nine months later, she gives birth to her baby and she's looking down and she's licking her baby and the baby's looking up at mom. And then the farmhands bring a wheelbarrow and they pick up that baby by the chest and stick him in the wheelbarrow and they carry the baby off. And the mother cries and tries to follow and they slam a gate in her face. And every every single dairy operation does this. I don't care where it is in, in the country uh, or in the world. And then when she's about four, they hang her up by the, the leg and slit her throat and kill her. And then they replace her with her daughter because the daughter creates more milk per unit feed. So the dairy industry is a meat industry. It's just you're going to squeeze milk out of them for a few years until you kill them. And that's true for, yeah, absolutely. Goat, that's true for goat milk, and, and thank you. cow's milk, it's true for all of it. Well, thank you for talking about that because you're one of the only plant-based doctors that does, maybe you and Dr. Gregor and Valerie, one of your PCRM cooking instructors says, thank you, Dr. Neil Barnard, for talking about food from the animal's perspective. It's hell, please go vegan. Since you brought that up, I just want to show you the magnet that I have on my refrigerator. Oh, wow. Because yeah, that, that really people do need to know about what really, uh, and, and you know, you, you didn't talk about this, but for me, just for, as somebody that likes to eat food, the amount of parts per million of blood, pus, feces, and urine, to me, that would be enough reason for people to not eat cheese or drink milk. People don't know about that, do they? Um, they don't know about it. And if you say it, they won't believe it. I'll say you're yeah. talking about bacteria in, in, in cheese or milk. It can't really be very serious. Or you're talking about hormones. Um, how could that really can't really matter? It can't be enough to matter. Um, uh, it, it's, it's an amazing thing when, when you meet people for whom it does matter, and it's lots of them. Um, Catherine Lawrence has uh, an experience that she has shared. She shared in the cheese trap. She was, she was uh, an aerospace engineer in, in, in Iraq. She was in the U.S. Air Force and she was in Iraq. Um, and when you're in a war zone, you don't eat much food. <laughs> you work really hard. Um, and when she got back home after her tour of duty, she, she was in Louisiana. And she started digging into all the things that she missed when she was overseas, especially mac and cheese and uh, cheese snacks and everything else. And she gained weight, but she also developed these pains in her abdomen. And it got worse and worse and worse. And the months went by, it was worse. So the, her gynecologist said, we have to do a laparoscopy. That's where you make a little incision in the belly and you look inside. And the 
gynecologist looked in her abdomen and she had endometriosis, which is clumps of cells all around the abdomen. They, those cells start inside the uterus, but in endometriosis, they come out and they plant all around the abdomen and they swell up uh, with your menstrual cycle. This is under the influence of estrogen. Um, to make a long story short, she went, she made the diet change that we recommend, get rid of all the cheese, get rid of all the animal products and keep oils low too. I mean, it was a, it was a healthy vegan diet. She lost weight. She felt better day by day by day. And then her gynecologist did a follow-up exam and made a little incision, looked all around and then sewed her up and went out to the, to the waiting room and said to her husband, this is amazing. Her endometriosis is essentially gone. And her husband said, well, you know, she went vegan and she, she made all these changes and she felt dramatically better. And the doctor said, no, 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 no. Foods don't cause endometriosis and there's no way that any kind of diet change is going to make it go away. This has just got to be a miracle. Um, and the truth is that foods affect hormones and hormone conditions in, in a very powerful way. So, so I can say there's hormones in it, but uh, people tend not to take that too seriously until they understand that's why you're having fertility problems. That's why you've got endometriosis. That's why your, your period comes on so heavy. Um, and I don't ask anyone to take this on faith. What we do is you put it to the test yourself and you can, you can see it within about, um, if a woman has uh, menstrual cycle problems, give yourself about two cycles, two months on a low fat, healthy, vegan diet and just see if it doesn't change your flow, change your cramps, change even if you have mood changes or concentration changes or bloating before your period or whatever, give it a shot and just see. And for so many people, it is life changing. And then, and Catherine reflected back when she found out that this is food, she burst into tears because she loved cheese. She was hooked on it. She was, she, in her words, she would say, I was addicted to this. And she finally realized she had to break that very bad love affair, um, <laughs> you know, and, and every, you know, everybody who's got addictions goes through this, which you think, is it, is this worth it to just feel rotten all the time in the service of something I'm putting down my esophagus? And the answer is no for, for most people. Yeah. Well, well, you know, you told people to try for two months and see what happens. But, you know, you know, you've seen probably thousands of patients. You've founded the Barnard Medical Center. This never doesn't work. I mean, really? Um, for oh, disease. Yeah. And, and the, what, what, we're, what we're discovering is all the things that it works for. Um, you know, I, I'm not. It's I guess it starts with weight loss. You know, so many people will see when they change their diet, they bring in healthy foods. It's so much easier to change your weight. Um, the struggle is taken out of it to a, to a great degree. And you have done more than anybody to really show how to, how to really put this into the best possible prescription, the best possible context. But then they discover it beyond weight loss. My diabetes gets better, my cholesterol gets better. Um, the real exciting liter literature now and frontier is Alzheimer's disease and other brain disorders because we're, we're discovering that um, fatty foods uh, cheese, meat, other sources of saturated fat are associated with Alzheimer's. And then there's a growing literature on, on just on mood in general, depression. Um, I am not saying that everyone is going to feel fantastic once, you, once you're vegan. But we, what we are discovering is that when people put healthy foods back into their diet, they, they do feel better in many ways. Um, their mood is better. Their anxiety is reduced a little bit. Their depression is lifted. Um, so we're exploring as to why would that be? What is it about these foods that will help us to reduce inflammation in the body. And then how does that affect brain chemistry in such a way that the lows aren't so low anymore? Um, so anyway, it's, it's just super exciting to see all the things that foods will do. Absolutely. And I love so much what you created. Um, you know what this is, right? I do. Yeah. And you created that the PCRM power plate, which just so happens to align perfectly with everything I teach about weight loss and calorie density. It, it's it's amazing how that works, isn't it? Yeah, funny how that works out, and, and you know, and we've we've seen a lot of progress with this. Back in 1991, we we said that those are the healthy food groups: vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and that meat and dairy. At the time, we said you don't need them; they're not required. Don't think of them as anything more than optional. And um, the U.S. government has kind of come kicking and screaming in the same kind of recognition that those are the foods really to emphasize it. 
And I'm proud to tell you that uh, in June of this year, the American Medical Association said that um, meat and dairy products, animal products in general, should be viewed as options, not daily requirements. So um, it's a slow process, but we're winning. You are, you're just tireless and, and the work you're doing is making such a huge difference for the planet, for human health, for animals. Do you think if somehow we could get you the job of Surgeon General, would you take it? Well, let, let me be clear. Um, this is not just, there are many, many, many people working in the same direction. And there are so many people who are doing really great research to, to lay it down the foundation of it. Our team does a lot here with Dr. Kelly Ove and her whole team. Um, what they're doing is great. But way before we got started, Dean Ornish was doing fantastic work and John McDougall um, and Caldwell Esselstyn's amazing work that he has done and, and Colin Campbell's wonderful work. There have been so many people who have been doing, um, really laying the foundation for it and so many people who are advocates and, and our friends at PETA and other animal groups who are saying, wake up. If you don't care about your coronary arteries, at least look inside a slaughterhouse. So there are so many people working in the same direction. Um, they all got their own piece of it. And um, so anyway, credit where credit's due. Okay. Well, you're, you're, you're very humble, but I, I, I think you've done quite a bit and we, we thank you so much for it. So well, we well, get the cheese. Is here is to bring the medical voice into it. Yes. And, you know, there, there have always been people who have said it's a good idea not to eat animals, but we needed to have the, we need to put it in medical terms. We need to help people understand what happens to your health. There's a whole ton of studies that needed to get done. And We've been busily spackling them in as the years go by. Well, you, you, would you like to talk a little bit about the Barnard Medical Center? Because we have a question if they offer phone consultations. What a great question. Um, yes, uh, the Barnard Medical Center is two years old now. Um, we're here in Washington, DC, and we do um, offer phone consultations. However, the way we're interpreting the law right now is that you have to come here physically once. Um, you have to see one of our doctors actually in person. And then, so the doctor will say, okay, to meet with the dietitian, you know, let's get you a whole plan. And, and that's what we do. Um, and, and by the way, if anybody has not been to Washington DC, please come and we'd love to see you. But after you've been seen once, then we can do telemedicine, but it depends on the jurisdictions that people are, are also in. And that's gradually expanding. So, yep. Terrific, terrific. Okay, so I'd like to move on to a little bit more about food addiction where it's in the plant-based world, because most of the people that follow me that will be at the conference to hear you speak, cheese is not their struggle. It's right. the processed foods, you know, the snacks, the sugars and the flowers, maybe sometimes alcohol. And as you know, most people are overweight now, but there seems to be a preponderance of overweight vegans. Uh, I was one myself for the first, I don't know, 26 years. I've been vegan for 41 years now. What do you think is causing so many vegans to be as Dr. Lyle and Goldhammer say, stuck in the pleasure trap and be overweight. And what can we do about it? Okay, uh, great question. And, and let's talk about that. But first I do wanna say that it's not that a vegan is more overweight than a person who's not vegan. Um, if a person is overweight and is a meat eater, and if they go vegan, that's a good move. Um, that's, there's every reason to do that. And people will lose a lot of weight, but they may find that they're not all the way there if, if the only thing they change was they got rid of the animal products. If that's all they did, they need to go further. But let me get rid of one other myth. There are some people who will say there's too much vegan junk food, and that's certainly true, but they, they want to pretend that some person was eating a little bit of salmon and some organic asparagus and was eating this whole healthy, healthy diet. And then when they went vegan, they went to the store and discovered vegan ice cream and started eating junk food for the first time in their life. That's a fantasy, that's not true. Um, the truth is, that there's a lot of junk food. Most of it is not vegan. Um, and then when people go to a vegan diet, they have made a very good step, a big step that will help them enormously. However, there's still junk food there. And if you're sugar addicted or addicted to a lot of snacks, you're not gonna really be at optimal health. So I think of a, a vegan diet as, as step one, it kind of opens the door and you've gotten rid of some really bad stuff. And for many people, they will lose a ton of weight just from that and their cholesterol level will fall. But if you're still stuck, it's true. Um, potato chips and, and donuts and things can, and vegan ice creams, all of these things pack calories, they pack sugar, they pack things that you know people don't need and all the fiber has been taken out and they are addictive. Um, people have found that sugar itself 
sugar itself triggers the release of opiates in the brain. And you can demonstrate this on day one of a baby's life. You take a pacifier. This is what you're talking about earlier, with magnetizing the baby. You put about a teaspoon of sugar into a cup of water and stir it up and put a baby's pacifier into the sugary water. Plunk it into the baby's mouth. And the baby will suck on that stuff. And while this is happening, the sugar will go to the baby's brain and trigger the release of opiates, which in turn trigger dopamine release, which is the pleasure chemical. And that child will be hooked on it at that point. Um, kids who are given sugar cry less because they are drugged up a little bit. And when we get to be a little bit older, we're not, we don't have pacifiers anymore, um, but we have Coca-Cola. <laughs> we have Dr. Pepper which despite its name is not, not a medical drink. Um, and there's 250 calories worth of sugar dumped into each one of those 20 ounce sodas. And it's, it's not like heroin. Um, the withdrawal is not so dangerous, but because it is ubiquitous in our culture, virtually everybody gets sugar addicted to a degree. And then people will say, oh no, I've got an addictive personality. I, you know, I had a bad childhood. I want to tell you something. Everybody had a rotten childhood. Everybody <laughs> did. To, to, to a degree, your parents were not experts. Your, for, you know, your first year of life, you were screaming and wailing all the time. You're miserable. This is part of our ex existence, some worse than others. But the reason you're addicted now is not because of you. It's because of the food. I can make you an alcoholic. If alcohol is everywhere and it's sold at every store and we gave it to kids in school, you'd have every kid having liver disease by the time they got their, their high school diploma because alcohol is addictive. Same with caffeine. Caffeine is, I'm not saying it's necessarily terrible, caffeine say, um, the, but people who are coffee drinkers, they know they're addicted. You know, it's not killing them. It's not ruining their life, but they can't get out of bed in the morning without their morning cup of coffee. So sugar is the same way. So I'm saying for some people, it's a benign addiction because they're having modest amounts. For other people, it is a not so benign addiction um, because they're having huge amounts. But it is not you. It's not your personality. There is nothing wrong with you. Um, there's a lot wrong with these foods that were human inventions. Sugar in foods was sugar cane in a plant. It was extract and the sugar was extracted in something Mother Nature never thought you would do or sugar beets in the ground. And they extract the sugar and they concentrate it. And then they mix it with little bits of fat and they find just the right amount of sugar and grease to make your chocolate bar irresistible. And you get hooked and that's 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 what it is. Do you think for some people though, the flour products and even nuts could have the same effect? Yeah, I do. Um, when I wrote Breaking the Food Seduction, I didn't I didn't really think that much about nuts. But I think that, that particularly the way nuts are sold um, in the store, it's not a raw almond. It's roasted and salted. And now if you go into the 7-Eleven, they've got wasabi flavor and they've got all kinds of stuff to, to just heighten the, the um, gustatory experience. Um, and same with peanuts. It's not a raw peanut you're eating. Um, it's not what nature had in mind. It's, it's roasted, salted. Some, in some cases, it's sugared up with a little uh, coating and whatnot. And the fat sugary mixture seems to be more addictive mm -hmm. than just a fatty food alone or even than a sugary food alone. You know, people don't take a box of Domino sugar and a spoon and just eat that. <laughs> they, they, no, they don't. And they don't just pour yeah. it into pour it into a, a glass of water and eat that. They don't want just sugar. And people say, I'm a sugar addict. No, you're not. You are eating, you typically mixtures of sugar and fat and starch all together. You might call it a cake or a pastry, but it's not pure sugar. It's sugar fat mixtures. Absolutely. Well, there's a couple of questions here about the keto diet, but I want to start that topic with a question that was submitted in advance by a doctor. And he t says that after what the health was released, you were criticized for giving a pass to sugar and implicating excess animal fat is a principal culprit in the cause of diabetes. Do refined carbohydrates also contribute to obesity and diabetes or is sugar okay? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for raising that. Uh, what the health, I think it was a terrific movie. I think um, it really hit home with so many people. And if, if anybody has not seen What the Health, please do watch it. It will change your life. But what happened is when the movie came out, the movie was, was criticized because people said that it was saying all the wrong things and da, da 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 And I was in the movie. And one of the things that I said was that sugar is not the driver for diabetes. And that's an important thing for people to understand um, because we know it does cause type 2 diabetes. 
and the naive 1950s view that still prevails today is okay sugar means i have too much I, i'm diabetes means i have too much sugar in my blood and so it must be that i ate sugar and that caused the sugar to get into my blood and now i'm diabetic and that's not the way it works um the way it works is that i eat a chicken salad sandwich with cheese for lunch particles of fat from the foods get into the muscles and the liver of the body. And the more you eat these fatty foods, the more particles of fat get into the muscle cells and liver cells. When the particles of fat build up, sugar can no longer get into those cells. They interfere with insulin signaling so that sugar can't get into the cells so easily. That's called insulin resistance. That's the big step toward diabetes. And then as time goes on, this process gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually the pancreas can't make enough insulin to overpower and you get diabetic. And so if a person stops eating sugar, I mean, that's a good move. They might reduce uh, starch a little bit. They'll, they'll, their blood sugar will lower, will drop, but they don't get rid of the diabetes. And they're on medications and they get worse and worse and worse and they die of complications in most cases. In 2003, NIH funded my research team to test a low fat vegan diet for type two diabetes. And what we now know is that when you get these fats out of your diet, then the fat that's in the liver and in the muscle cells starts to diminish. Insulin sensitivity starts to be restored. And then the sugar can get out of your blood finally because it can get back into the muscles and the liver where it's supposed to. And that's the issue with diabetes. And it's been um, challenging to get this word out to people, but it's, it's real. Now, I'm not, I, I did not give a pass to sugar. I, what I want to say is that if you're looking at type 2 diabetes, sugar is not public enemy number one. Um, the, we, we know what causes it now, and that's not it. But sugar has all the other issues that we've described. And, and one of the worst parts of sugar is that it's a Trojan horse. What I mean is I got a cookie, and the little sprinkles and all the sweet stuff lures me in. And 60% of that cookie is butter fat, um, and that's, what really, that's where the calories really pack in. So the sugar lead, uh, lures you in and the fat fattens you up. So they, so they really do work together. So I, don't, I didn't mean to say that sugar is, is somehow health food. What I did mean to say is it's very naive to think that that's the whole reason people are diabetic. So that leads us to the next question. Anytime I hear of somebody that's been diagnosed with diabetes or prediabetes, I either buy them or recommend they get your book on reversing diabetes. And invariably they say, oh, well, my doctor said I can't eat carbs, like, you know, meaning good carbs, complex carbs like sweet potatoes or, or even beans. And they always put them on like a more keto or paleo diet. So uh, what do you do? Because especially someone like me, I'm not a doctor. I can't I mean, I can give them your book, but how do you how do you deal with that when, when yeah, that's well, what doctors seem to believe? Uh, some do. Many don't. Um, it, it, the American Diabetes Association was the first organization to really publish our well, they, they were the first organization to publish our NIH findings. And that was back in 2006. And my hat is off to them because they really mainstreamed it. And and the AD, American Diabetes Association would write in their guidelines for doctors that doctors are supposed to read about the value of a plant-based diet. Now they will endorse other approaches as well. They'll talk about what a Mediterranean diet will do and other things, um, but it's not as if this work isn't out there. Um, it is. And the federal government uh, in 2015 said vegetarian diets are one of the three principal diets that people should know about. So I think the problem is that it just sounds so attractive to do a keto diet. Maybe I'll be on the cover of Men's Health. Um, and uh, you know, People fall for these um, fads, I guess, really. Um, and, 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 you know, in fairness, um, if you eat sugar, your blood sugar will rise. And if you stop eating all sugar and all starch, your blood sugar will fall. But you, you haven't tackled the cause of it, which is the buildup of fat in the cells. And you're not really, really attacking the pathology and, and you're not going to stop the complications. So we encourage people to go to a healthy diet. And, and, and for anybody who's in doubt, think of the big picture. Back in the 1940s or 50s, diabetes was really, really rare in rural Japan, in China. They were eating rice all day long. They never heard of a keto diet. They were eating a starchy diet. In Okinawa, you had the longest of people in the world, and their dietary staple was sweet potatoes. Still is. Um, and once McDonald's invaded those countries, and their starch intake fell, 
and their meat and cheese intake went up, diabetes came roaring in. So if starch was the cause of type two diabetes, they would have had a lot before and they would have less now. It is not. And so our, our prescription has to fit the evidence and happily there's no shortage of the evidence. Absolutely. So how else can we get our dopamine if we're not eating all these pleasurable, highly palatable foods? Well, um, lots of great ways of getting dopamine. Um, and you know, dopamine again is the pleasure chemical. And, and to tell you the truth, I think that the best thing for people to do is to break up with a bad love affair because realize that it's, um, your love affair with foods is not really helping you. It's making you feel rotten in the morning. Um, and once people separate themselves from it, it's like quitting smoking or anything else. After, you know, for, for a couple of days, you'll have moments of doubt. But then you get away from it, you feel better and better and better. And then you can build back into your life the things that naturally give you dopamine. One is physical activity. So you go out dancing or you're playing tennis or you're going out for a run or a walk with your dog or whatever it is. And you feel better and you think, oh, just breathing the air is a good thing. And that's true. But you're exercising muscles cause you get a little bit of dopamine from just that. Uh, do it with somebody else. Maybe you're doing it as part of a Zumba class or an aerobics class somewhere else. Being with other people causes the trigger, triggers the release of a little bit of dopamine too. If you are alone, if you are sedentary, you don't get it. Um, music causes a little bit of dopamine. And you know, um, that's been a, another big part of my life. Um, these, th there's no calories in Beethoven. Um, and so, you know, if our lives are filled with beauty in other ways and not just in cat with calories, if we have social interactions, um, if we have physical exercise, your body kind of adjusts to a healthier rhythm. And I, I, I know what people are, are thinking, well, you know, I really love these foods. I don't want to give them up. But for me, I used to smoke cigarettes back when I was a medical student. I hate to confess this to you, but it's true. And as a resident, I quit. Sm I, I smoked too, but and I, I loved being a smoker because cigarettes kind of got me through those busy mornings. But when I stopped smoking, I realized I really liked being a non-smoker. And when I used to eat burgers as a kid, I loved burgers, but now I love not eating them. Um, so when people go through the transition to a healthier diet, they're they end up being really, really glad that they've come through that transition. Well, you're in a band, so you must get a lot of dopamine. <laughs> well, yeah, it's true, you know, I mean, and it's not just my band, by the way, my band is called Carbon Works, as in we are made of carbon, and these are our works, so go on to YouTube, we've got, I don't know how many videos up there, um, they're fun, and I hope you get a little dopamine squirt in your brain from it, but, but you know, when you look at musicians, they have interesting lives, um, they never stop a song in the middle and say, I want to have some ice cream, um, they are so charged up with it, just that the rhythms of the music create dopamine in the brain. But the problem with musicians is that if, if they are with the Pittsburgh Symphony and they are staying there and they are never touring, they live lives of moderation. However, as soon as you put them on the road and it's a different city every night and they're playing till 3 a.m., they actually are at pretty, pretty big risk um, because drugs and alcohol are everywhere. And so that the little bit of dopamine from music isn't protecting them enough. So. Yeah. Well, not not to embarrass you, Dr. Barnard, but a lot of the ladies are commenting that they're getting lots of dopamine just from watching you right now. So, <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Right back at you. So, you know, you you mentioned about exercise, and you talk a lot about exercise in one of your other books, Power Foods for the Brain, about how important it is just for preventing things like Alzheimer's. But it's also really good for for weight loss and for recovering from food addiction, isn't it? I mean, it's it's yeah. it's it does more than just you know give you big muscles. Um, it, do, it does all those things. Um, with regard to Alzheimer's, where, what I was most inspired by was work at the University of Illinois, where they brought in a group of people who were having some memory issues. Their memories were sputtering a little bit, like, what was the name of that actor in the movie? You know, you, you couldn't, they couldn't remember. So they asked them to take a brisk walk three times a week. And it was a 10 minute walk, three times a week. And then the next week, 15 and then 20 and 25, and five minutes were added to the duration every week until they got up to 40 minutes three times a week. What they showed was that their memories were better and the hippocampus, which is the, the brain structure that's central to memory, um, stopped shrinking. It, it stopped shrinking and started to expand a little bit because of the exercise program. So if you could do it with a brisk walk 40 minutes three times a week, that's not so, not so bad. But as you're doing all this, you're not just protecting the brain, you're outside, you're doing things, your heart is pumping, so it's good for your heart. 
Uh, cancer risk diminishes breast cancer in particular, is lower in women who are regular exercisers. And, and the real combination is to eat in a healthy way and put the exercise together. But the thing, the other thing about exercise is while you're exercising, you are not going to bring a chocolate sundae with you. So it's calorie free fun and you can exercise with other people. So, uh, you know, you, you just feel so much better after you've done it. And, and for anybody who's a little reluctant, this is where I'm going to sound like a sneaker commercial. You know, the just do it phenomenon. Um, you're going to think, ah, I don't feel like exercising tonight. I just don't. I'm too busy. You, you really do have to say, just do it. And it doesn't matter if you don't do it really long or intensely, but just do it because you're never going to feel, you, you are never going to feel like I want to punish my body right now. <laughs> you are never going to feel today is my day to exercise. I am that puppy who just wants to go for a run. That is not you. What you must say to yourself is just do it. Just get started. And you do your walk or your run or whatever it is with other people, you do your aerobics class. And when you get to the end of it, you're going to say, I'm glad I did it. And then that becomes a little bit addicting too. You know, you kind of, you, you want to do it. You know, we, it, we're creatures of habit. So once you're in that habit of doing it on a schedule, you're going to stick with it. So, so, so just do it. You just say, I'm not going to wait until I feel like doing it. I'm just going to do it. For me, morning is the time I like to do it. I like to do it before breakfast. You know, I get up and I lace up my stinkers. I think, I don't feel like this. As soon as you get out, you are so happy you're doing it. You're so right, Dr. Barnard, because I waited for about 52 years till I felt like exercise. That never happened. So you're, you're absolutely right. May I ask, do you do any form of regular exercise? Yeah, I do. Um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you what I prefer to do. I get knocked off it all the time, so I have to approximate this. But the favorite, I'm not a huge runner. Here at, at the Barnard Medical Center, I got like mega runners here. And, and I mean, real star athletes. Um, Steve Niebuhr, who works here, he's, he, we had a conference in, in L.A., and before the conference, I saw him at eight in the morning. He had already run 20 miles that just that day. That was just his way of getting out of bed. Like, oh, I got, you know, but I'm not like that. For me, I like to do three miles three times a week. So nice. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, something like that. And I run it. I mean, I, I don't, but you know, if, if I haven't been doing it for a while, I have to do kind of a run walk and then it takes me a few days to kind of get back into it. Or if I'm traveling, I get all goofed up. Um, and I get completely uh, bored if it's just me doing it. So I've got to listen to a radio or a language tape or, or something while I'm going. But that's it. And, and I, that works for me. Well, today when I did my one hour spin, I watched some of your videos just to prepare. And it was, it was great. It felt like five minutes. So Cheryl's saying that Zumba is great for the dopamine hit. And I would imagine because you're combining the music and the, and the exercise together. And, so. the, and the social part of it. You know, right, so three things, exercise yeah. and social. Yeah, that's why it's so popular, and it's a great thing. Absolutely. So, what about kids? Like, you know, we see we're seeing so many more obese children more than ever before. Is this food addiction hereditary? Is it just the environment? And how do parents help transition the kids? Because kids can be really difficult, especially with dairy, not wanting to give it up. Uh, absolutely true. Um, it's it's hereditary only in that you're giving DNA to your kids, and and. Included in every human being's DNA is the responsiveness to sugar and and to cheese and all these things. Your kids have have dopamine receptors just like you do. They have taste buds that, that detect sugar. Their brain responds to the casomorphins that are in cheese. So rule number one, I have to say, is parents have to be parents. There are many parents, include, particularly vegans. Let me say a word to, to all vegan parents. If you were saying, well, for me, I went vegan, but I want my kids to choose. Um, and you, you let the kid choose, should they eat meat or not? Should they have dairy or not? And, and they'll say, well, how old are your, is your kid? Well, my kid's six and the other one's four. Don't give them a choice. Make, if, have a vegan diet for the whole family because they're not old enough to read peer reviewed literature. They're not old enough to make a decision like that. So the, the reason people let the kids choose is that they themselves are, they don't have a culture that made them convinced that this is the right way to go. They know they're not going to let their kids smoke cigarettes. If the kid is 18 years old and smoking at, you know, at a frat party, they can't stop. It. But in this house, you are not going to smoke cigarettes. And it should be that way with food. So, right. so if the parents aren't in agreement, the parents have to sit down, close the door, and iron this out and decide that the kids need a healthy diet. And don't buy it. If, a, if, a parent, if one of the parents will not go along with you, you say, all right, I don't want that in the house. And it's not an option for the kids. And I don't want you taking the kids out for pizza behind my back. 
and I want to teach the kids and, and work with the kids, explain it to them, and they will get it and they will appreciate it and explain the animal part and explain the environmental part. And they will have every challenge at school and everywhere else, but you have laid the foundation of truth for them, which they need to hear. And even if they rebel, you have planted the seeds that are gonna keep them healthy later on and they will appreciate it. But don't say, well, it's up to you. It's not up to you. You're not gonna smoke a cigarette. You know, you're not gonna be eating cheese. You're not gonna do these things, but get, get educated yourself. You have to know what a healthy diet is. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans. The kids do need B12 supplementation, just like adults do. So, but it's not rocket science. It's easy to do, but but insist on it in your household. Absolutely. Absolutely. While you were saying parents, 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 parents people were saying amen. So that's yeah. terrific. Yeah. So, so if you want to know if you'll please autograph her book in Vegas. I'm oh, sorry. aren't you sweet? I would I would love to do that, but do me one favor. Um, after we do that, I want you to think of somebody else who needs it, loan it to them and put a post-it note or two in the book somewhere and tell your friends that you thought of them on that page. And then the reason for the post-it note is it makes them open the book up and then they can start reading it. And then you're going to get somebody else hooked on what you already know. So you bet. We're going to be Absolutely. propagandists together. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. We have time for just one more quick question. And if you guys have questions from Dr. Barnard for Dr. Barnard, consider coming to the live conference in Vegas or getting the live stream where you'll also be able to ask questions. So the last question is, what can we do to support you, your work, just to make a world, the world a better place like you've done? What, what, what can we do? How can we help you? Well, aren't you sweet? Thank you. Well, we're all working on this together and whatever people are doing in their own lives and supporting whatever organizations they work with, I think is great. What we're doing now, let me mention, um, for anybody who's in California, right now there are bills in the state legislature that you can help with right now. Uh, in fact, one of them isn't on food. One of them is on animal testing. Do you mind my mentioning that just real quick? I absolutely would love for you to mention it. Okay, there is a bill um, which would ban the uh, sale of any cosmetic product that is animal tested. And it only applies to California. But if animal tested products can't be sold in California, then no manufacturer is going to want to animal test them because they lose that whole market. This bill passed the uh, Senate in California. It's now going to the assembly. And um, please, please, please call your, your assembly members and ask any friends of you uh, that you have in California, ask them to call too and say, we want to support the bill that stops animal testing of cosmetics. We can win this. So that's, that's that. Uh, there's another bill in the state legislature that would say that all hospitals must serve vegan meals. Now they can serve double bacon cheeseburgers, but if they don't have anything vegan, that's gotta change. I think we can win this, but call your members uh, of the California legislature and say, healthy food for hospitals, duh, let's make this happen. So please do that. Um, if you're in the Washington DC area, come by and see us at Barnard Medical Center. Um, it's the only <laughs> medical center around here where we're gonna spend a whole lot more time talking about your diet than we will talk about drugs. Now, if you have a twisted ankle or urinary tract infection, we'll treat that too. But, uh, but the food is always central to, to the work that we do. Um, do use our Kickstart if you would like. Uh, it's at pcrm.org and it's in English and Spanish and Mandarin and 600,000 some people have used it. So jump in and have fun with that. It's free, it's not commercial. Um, have a look at the cheese trap. See what you think about that. Oh, oh, I forgot to say, I have a new book coming out um, December. It's the Vegan Starter Kit. You, you've seen these Vegan Starter Kits, these little magazines. Well, I wrote a short book version of it with more detail. And that's coming out, I think it's right at the end of December. So spread the word and, and buy 25 copies for all of your friends who, who aren't vegans, but kind of need a push in that direction. So that's, that's called the Vegan Starter Kit coming out in the winter. Oh, God, terrific. Well, thank you so much, so very much for your time and your tireless efforts on behalf of humans, animals, and the planet. Uh, we, we just love you, Dr. Barnard, and we're so honored that you're going to be the keynote at Vegas, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing you there. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living Live. Please share this broadcast and check out pcrm.org, the 21 Day Kickstart, and all the other great things that uh, they're doing. Well, thanks right back at you, AJ. Thanks for all the fantastic work that you're doing. Can't wait to see you in Vegas. Well, thank you so much. And I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy, taste delicious. Thanks, everyone.